A normie. Yeah. <laughs> I got to say, that's a new one. I don't know. I must have had my head in the sand. I've just not heard the term before. Um, I got news for you. I am not a normie. Thank you. Hey, my name is Craig, and I am not a normie. I don't have to tell you guys that nobody is what they appear to be. So I don't know what your perception of me is, but uh, let me introduce myself. In fact, I'm going to introduce myself this way. I've been married for 48 years. I've been a Christian for 50 years. I was a lead pastor for 44 years. And I'm happy to continue to be serving Jesus in my church. I planted a church in Bellingham. I planted another church in Grand Coulee. I pastored a church in Wilbur, and then I pastored for 35 years at Mission Church. And God's used me to impact a lot of people's lives. That's one introduction. And that's an introduction that somebody might have made introducing me to a group of people. But let me introduce myself a little more authentically, because those are facts, and they're all true, and those are kind of the headlines or the bullet points. But the real story is this. There was a 15-year-old young man by the name of Craig whose parents got divorced, and when they did, his dad that he had a close relationship with walked out of his life, and of course, I'm that guy. I was very close to my dad, and when he left, he was divorcing my mom, but it felt like he was abandoning me and rejecting me. And I remember the day that he woke me up and said, I'm going to work today, and I won't be home tonight. And I started crying. I was 15 years old and, you know, typical teenage boy, I suppose, in a lot of ways, but hadn't gotten into much trouble yet. But I remember crying like a baby and pleading with him not to leave, but he left. And that was the beginning of me starting to act out. It wasn't very long after that at all that I first started with drugs, started with some marijuana and started drinking. And then my marijuana habit got to be pretty habitual, and so I thought, well, I'm too cheap to buy my own drugs, so I think maybe I could find a way to sell drugs and support my habit and make a little cash on the, on the side so I could buy my LSD and my other stuff that I was wanting to have. Well, my brother was living in San Diego, so he became my supplier. He'd go over the border into Mexico and he'd get a key and bring that kilo up the freeway to Los Angeles where I was living. And then I'd cut school with my buddies and we would go to the house while my mom was at work and we'd cure it in the oven and break it down into baggies. And then I'd take those in my lunch the next day and actually for the next several days, sell them on the the campus of my high school. I was making a mess of my life in those days and becoming very addicted to the drugs, psychedelic drugs, the marijuana, drinking. And uh, I, I like to sum it up when I tell my story. I, I, realize, I didn't realize it at the time, but I realize now that I was going nowhere very fast. Headed down all the wrong roads and didn't even realize it. My mom was the one that I was living with, my dad had walked out of my life. My mom was getting gray hair, worrying about me. She was, um, you know, just fit to be tied with the decision she was watching me make, and yet she felt powerless to do anything about it. And by the time I was uh, just about 19, I was living with my, my brother down in, the same brother that had been my supplier, I was living with my brother down in San Diego, and my, my mom, she called me up. She says, there's going to be this guy speaking at my church, and I wish you'd come and hear him. I'm like, Why do I want to go to your church, Mom? Your, your mom, really? I mean, it's just to me, it was just the, the furthest thing from my mind. It was my mother, after all, and her church, like, are you kidding me? Just a bunch of old people that were like, you know, in their 60s. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, that's me now, right? Um, and so I, I told her no, and then we hung up the phone. This is before cell phones. She called my brother's house again, probably three or four more times, and begged me to come. Finally, I just said, all right, fine, I'll come. And so I jumped on my motorcycle, and in those days, I was an idiot in a lot of ways, but I rode my motorcycle barefooted often, no helmet. It's a true story. There wasn't a helmet law in California at that time. So I, I rode 100 miles up to my mom's church, and I met my buddies there. It's so like, I'm not doing this by myself. So I got my, 
my stoner buddies to, to come join me. And we walked in, and it was a bunch of old people. You know, at least in their 30s. 40s and fit. No, actually, they were actually quite a bit older than that, but 40s and on up, and most of them were gray hair, 50s and 60s. Anyway, this is like totally irrelevant. This is not my scene. So it's like we looked around and saw some stairs, so we went up in the balcony. I will hide out up here, and then later, after I endure this thing, survive this experience, I'll tell my mom, yeah, thanks for the invite, and, you know, I'll be done. But that night, the speaker that she wanted me to come here presented Jesus in a way that made sense to me. Now, I, I have to say that at that time in my life, I didn't think I needed anything. You know, a lot of times the story is I, I'm addicted or I was addicted and I know I need help and I'm struggling and I'm failing and, uh, and I, I keep falling down, but I, I, you know, by God's grace, get back up and I keep falling down. That was not me. I was doing drugs and enjoying it. And I was selling drugs and begging people to share drug experiences with me. I wasn't looking for change, but I knew God, I, I found out later, I understand now, God knew that I needed change. God knew what I needed way more than I did. In fact, I was not even at all aware. I was oblivious to the need that I had in my life. Have you experienced that where you don't realize how much you need what you need and it takes other people and the Lord himself to help you see, hey, this, you, you need. You're, you're, you, you, have, you have needs that need to be met. You have needs that need to be taken care of. You have issues in your life. You have things that you need to deal with, and you don't even realize it. And that was me at that time. I was talking with Matthew. I said, I said why do you want me to come share my story? I've been a Christian for 50 years, and, and during those 50 years, not, you know, that's 50 years of sobriety. So my story's not... A recent one, he said, exactly, come tell that story. And so I'm here to tell that story, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to make it, um, I'm not going to embellish it or make it uh, appear to be something that it's not because the fact of the matter is during those 50 years, I've had my ups and downs. In fact, some of my worst ups and downs, not, not with drug addiction or alcohol, but, but other kinds of struggles, uh, my, my ups and downs have happened, some of the worst of them, while I have been a pastor of a church. You know, as a pastor, sometimes you have to kind of keep up the, the, the image, you know, be encouraging for people, even when you're down, uh, try to bring a positive message, even when you're feeling negative. I mean, there, there's a certain amount of pressure on us guys, right, Ben? <laughs> just, just a little bit. By the way, uh, thank you, Matthew and Sarah and Ben and Angie and everybody. Thank you for even having me here tonight. It's a, a real privilege for me. Thank you. <laughs> And it's, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Um, I don't know all of you and love to, to get to know you, but, but I see a number of you here that I recognize, of course, from Mission Church and other places. And, and by the way, Ben, Ben's been, I, I don't know if you know this, but he uh, worked for us at Mission Church. Um, started about eight years ago, is that give or take? Yep. And uh, been gone a year. And I just want to go on record and say, if you're ever done with him and want to send him back, we'll take him gladly. <laughs> I'm not sure Angie would go along with that, but maybe Ben wouldn't either. Now, it's really wonderful to see what God's doing in this environment over this last year and, and on the, in the Sunday environments as well, and just, just how God's using Northbridge to impact so many lives. And, and uh, it's a privilege for us to have uh, sent out Ben and Angie and, and encouraged many of you to, to join them in this work and to see how God's changing lives. But, but let me get back to my story. So... so <clears throat> That night, I gave my heart to Jesus. The, 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 the way that Jesus, I don't remember a thing the guy said. By the way, the guy was Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel, and he was a guest speaker at my mom's church. And I, when I gave my heart to Christ that Thursday, it was a Thursday night, by the way, in September. When I gave my heart to Christ, I decided, I'm, I was enrolled in college, and it's like, I'm not going to college. I'm going to go see what that guy knows. Because whatever he's been saying makes sense to me, and I want to learn from him. And I didn't know him, and I wasn't a church guy. I grew up in, in, a, in a home where, where my mom and dad detested organized you know, religion, as they termed it, or churches. And their, 
you know, their approach to things. I, I had no experience whatsoever. I was just a regular old heathen, just a regular old run-of-the-mill pagan, you know. And so I go to his church, to Chuck's church, and I just start soaking up like a sponge everything that he's teaching me about Jesus. And, and I realize, holy mackerel, this is, this is what I need. And this Jesus is amazing. And, and I started realizing how deep my need was and how off track I was in the way I was living my life. And, and it wasn't just drugs and alcohol, but it was all the things that I valued and all the things that I was pursuing and all the things that I thought were important. And, and now I'm realizing, man, was I off base. And Jesus starts to get me thinking differently. And over the course of many months, he, he began to deal with, with some of the issues in my life. And, and the first one that he began to deal with was the hatred I had for my dad. Yeah, I, my brothers and I were as angry as we could be with our dad for doing that to us, but most importantly for doing that to our mom. He, he had been, we found out later, cheating on her for years. They were married almost, it was two weeks prior to their 25th wedding anniversary when he walked out. But he hadn't been faithful at all during those times. He had numerous affairs. And the current affair that he was having was with somebody from the, his work environment. And uh, it was her that he moved in with. He'd been spending the night there occasionally calling at work, you know, how guys will do. And uh, so he moved in with her and eventually they got married. But, but we were just, my brothers and I, just angry. And my mother, of course, wounded to the core over it all. So the first thing Jesus began to do is just deal with me about my attitude toward my dad and how that needed to change, how I needed to forgive him. It's like, well, I'm not going to forgive him. He doesn't deserve to be. And then I began to learn that forgiveness is first for my sake. I need to forgive. And it doesn't hinge on whether he deserves it. It doesn't depend on him asking for it. It doesn't depend on him uh, apologizing. In fact, I can't wait for him to take any action whatsoever. I need to take the first step and I need to forgive him from my heart. And so I did. And then the Lord said, and now I want you to reach out to him. Are you kidding me? <laughs> what did I sign up for here? I thought Jesus was amazing until he started requiring stuff of me. <laughs> right? But, but I began to reach out to my dad and did what I could to, to mend the the fence there. You know, every one of us has a past and every one of us has a story. And none of us is exactly what people think we are. You know, there's, there's three versions of yourself, you know, right? You've heard this said. There's the version you want other people to see. There's the version of yourself that other people actually see. Those are often two different things, right? Because people see through us, don't they? Right? I mean, well, they don't see through you, probably. <laughs> yeah, they do, right? I, we, I don't have to tell a group like this how you just instantly detect when somebody's not being authentic. Like, you know when they're not being real. And that's why I told Matthew and, and Ben, I, I, didn't, I didn't come to teach or preach here tonight or do a Bible study or anything like that. This is me sharing my testimony. I'm, I'm going to actually have the privilege of being here on Sunday, so I'd encourage you all and, and invite you to come back. Because I will, I will teach, and I'm going to share what God's put on my heart for, for Sunday. But tonight is about my testimony, and I, and I am just going to share one verse. A verse that, by the way, what a great song. Uh, several of the songs that we sang tonight. And then the bumper, holy mackerel, that's exactly what was on my heart and, and in my thoughts for tonight. This is Revelation 12. Some of you recognize it. Just listen. It says, verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. You know who the accuser is because he accuses you just like he accuses me. And he's been incessant about that. I mean, he just never quits accusing me and has for 50 years. Now, I don't know if that's discouraging to you, but wait for it because there's really great news coming. Because the accuser who accuses us before our God day and night has been hurled down. Wait for it. Next verse. They triumphed over him. 
by the blood of the Lamb. It's Jesus' blood that makes it possible for our sin to be forgiven, our shame to be taken away, and a new life to start in Him. They triumphed over Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I was thinking about it earlier when we were singing, and I thought, I'm not sure who's going to get the most out of tonight, you guys or me. <laughs> and, and that's because it does my heart good to share my story. There's power in sharing your story. And again, I'm kind of preaching the choir because you guys are all about your, your story, your testimony. But, but I'm here to say, not only is it encouraging at a human level, but there's a spiritual dynamic associated with telling your story. It's part of how you overcome the one who accuses you and tries to shame you and guilt you and keep you down. The blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. And then, I don't really like this next part of the verse. Can I just stop right there and not read it? And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. Willing to lay their lives down. The longer I live and the older I get, the more I realize that Paul was on to something in Philippians chapter 1 when he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm less and less afraid of death than I've ever been in my life. And that's because of the blood of the Lamb and the work that He did on the cross and the things that He's done in my life and the way that He's changed me and the hope that I have in Him and the fact that I realize everything in this life is just temporary. It's just temporary. So our testimony, our story, is something we should tell. We should tell it often. But we need to tell it in an authentic way. And we need to tell it in a way that gives Jesus the credit for what he's done. You gave me a short outline. I don't know if this is like what everybody does, you know. Let's see now if I remember right. It's, yeah, experience, strength, and hope. So, hey, how about that, right? Um, I've got a little handout here with notes and an outline. The experience, no, I don't have that tonight. But I'm telling you my experience and I'm telling you where the strength came from. And I'm telling you we have hope. And it is all wrapped up in Jesus. When I, when I shared with Matthew, I said, you know, it's, it's been 50 years since I, I struggled like I did in my teen years. Um, he said, well, that's good. People need to hear that, that you can go 50 years clean and sober. And the Lord willing... Another 30 years or so. I don't know if I want to live that long, but until the day I die, right? I, I, I wanted to just take a little time and talk a little bit more about what I, I referenced earlier when I said, you know, that we don't know sometimes what we need. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to give up drugs. I didn't want to give up alcohol. Didn't think I needed to give them up. Didn't think I needed a, a relationship with Christ. Didn't think I needed hope. I didn't think I needed, you know, his forgiveness. I didn't have any awareness of the fact that I needed what I really truly did need and found in Jesus until after I found it. And I just wonder tonight how many of us have needs that we're not even aware of. You know, there's an old saying that, you know, that has to do with, us asking for what we ask for and, and God giving us what we actually need. You know, that, that we should be grateful sometimes that he doesn't give us what we ask for. <laughs> and we should also be grateful that he does give us what we need even when we're asking for something else. And I, I just want to encourage you with that thought here tonight that there's a God in heaven who sent his son Jesus and his spirit is with us in this life who knows what we need better than we do. And he will bring people into our life and bring experiences and opportunities into our life that he knows will benefit us and help us to become the men and women of God that he intends for us to be. He has a future for you and a future for, for me that involves him having his way in our lives. And he will bring along life experiences and people to help bring that about. So um, 
let, you know, I, I said 50 years with ups and downs. Let me, let me just tell you that most of my ups and downs over those 50 years have not had to do with drugs and alcohol like, like, like they did in my teen years before I came to Christ. But those ups and downs have had to do with me just not being content with my life. And uh, any of you who have been at Mission Church for any length of time, you've heard me talk about this from time to time, and I'll reference it. For me, contentment is very, very hard, very elusive. Because whatever my circumstances seem to be, however good it may look from the outside, inside I always seem to want something different or something more. Anybody relate to that? You know, I, I, who was it? Where did you go? You were up here sharing about um, how your life is better, you're able to give and have a car to drive. Where would you go? There you are. Sorry, I lost track of where you were. I, I was listening to that because it, it speaks to me. I remember when I first met my wife, I was living in a, in a, a Datsun pickup truck with a canopy shell on it. And the, and the brakes didn't work. And my wife won't ever let me forget it. I, I, seriously, I was living out of the back of my Datsun pickup truck. And I was a Christian already, but a brand new one. And I didn't have five bucks to my name, hardly. And her dad thought I was a bum and that she ought to avoid me at all costs. Steer clear of that guy. He can't even hold down a job. I could, but I didn't have one at the time. And I remember being challenged. You, you talked about giving. I remember being challenged at the church we were attending, which is where I met my wife. And they asked for pledges to give to some cause. I don't remember what it was. And I thought, I don't have any money to give. And then they said, well, if you just make a pledge, God will be faithful to provide it if you'll be committed to give it when he provides it. And I thought, okay, I've never done that before. So I thought, I'll give $5 a month. It's $5 I don't have, don't have a job, don't have any income, but if God gives me five bucks, I'll give it. And he did, and I did. And then it became five bucks a week, and he did, and then I did. And it's just been the Lord's blessing, you know, over and over and over again over the years. And my wife and I, when we were in Bible college, we were about as poor as, as can be. We, one time we had, our house went down to about 50 degrees. We were living in Portland because we had no money for heating oil and our furnace was an oil furnace. We had times when we didn't have food in the cupboards and people would leave groceries on the front, front porch, you know, anonymously. I mean, we, we've been through those kinds of experiences, you know, in our early years and in my Bible college years and even the first few years of my, my first church as a lead pastor. I was working a, a job and we were struggling to make ends meet. And, and sometimes I just need to be reminded of those days and realize that even though those things are not true now in my life, I'm no better off than I was then, really, because everything I've ever needed, Jesus has provided in the lean times and in the good times. And I'm beginning to understand a little better what Paul meant when he said, I've learned the secret of being content in whatever circumstances I find myself in. He says, I've learned to do with plenty and I've learned to do with next to nothing. That's the Craig paraphrase of Philippians chapter 4. But he said, I, it, I've realized that my contentment is not tied to my circumstances. And I'm kind of preaching to myself here for a moment, but hopefully it'll help you. That, that when, when you find yourself not thankful for what is true, and you're focused on what's not yet true, that you wish was true, and you find yourself being content, perhaps you could ask the Lord to help you remember back to a time that's been maybe fading from your memory. It might go back, you know, years and years. It might just go back a few weeks. But remember a time when you were so thankful that this happened or that happened or the other thing happened, that you, you, you got a job or you, you, you had, you know, uh, unexpected source of income come your way or you got a, a car to drive finally after not having one for who knows how long or you... You know, you met a special someone and a relationship started and you'd been praying for years for that and, and now it's starting to happen. And we, we, lose, we lose sight of those things for which we should be thankful. And so um, I, I just, my story is one of over the years and it, Ben's been around on staff and in our friendship, I'm sure you picked up on this. I've said it publicly and privately 
that it's one of my biggest challenges to be content. But here's, here's the final thought I'll leave you with. Um, in, in his letter to Timothy, Paul says this. He says, uh, Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world. Instruct them with these things. And as in that chapter, when, when Paul is addressing this, he says, and, and by the way, let me remind you that godliness with contentment is great gain. Let your heart be a heart after Jesus and be content with your circumstances exactly the way they are right now. And you will be way ahead of most people, people like myself, who struggle with contentment. But when I get it dialed in and my relationship with Jesus is what it should be, that's when I'm doing really well. And it has nothing to do with the outward circumstances or the headlines of what I've accomplished or however many years I've been in ministry. Please don't be taken in by the illusion of people that are up in the front who are pastors or leaders or somehow you know, thought to be this, that, or the other thing. We're just people like you who struggle just like you do, who have ups and downs like you do, and who are trying to figure it out just like you're trying to figure it out. Thanks, Matthew.